For pray, who was Heemskirk? Ye shall see at once how unreasonable this dread of Heemskirk. Certainly his nature was malevolent enough. That was obvious. Directly you heard him laugh. Nothing gives away more a man's secret disposition than the unguarded ring of his laugh. But bless my soul, if we were to start at every evil guffaw, like a hare at every sound, we shouldn't be fit for anything but the solitude of a desert, or the seclusion of a hermitage. And even there we should have to put up with the unavoidable company of the devil. However, the devil is a considerable personage, who has known better days, and has moved up high in the hierarchy of celestial host. But in the hierarchy of mere earthly Dutchmen, Heemskirk, whose early days could not have been very splendid, was merely a naval officer forty years of age, of no particular connections or ability to boast of. He was commanding the Neptune, a little gunboat employed on Drury Patrol duty up and down the Archipelago to look after the traders. Not a very exalted position, truly. I tell you, just a common middle-aged lieutenant of some twenty-five years' service, and sure to be retired before long. That's all. He never bothered his head very much as to what was going on in the Seven Isles group, till he learned from some talk in Mintock, or Palembang, I suppose, that there was a pretty girl living there. Curiosity, I presume, caused him to go poking around that way, and then, after he had once seen Freya, he made a practice of calling at the group whenever he found himself within a half day's steaming from it. I don't mean to say that Heemskirk was a typical Dutch naval officer. I have seen enough of them not to fall into that absurd mistake. He had a big, clean-shaven face, great, flat, brown cheeks with a thin, hooked nose, and a small, pursy mouth squeezed in between. There were a few silver threads in his black hair, and his unpleasant eyes were nearly black too. He had a surly way of casting side glances without moving his head, which was set low on a short round neck, a thick round trunk in a dark undress jacket with gold shoulder straps, was sustained by a straddly pair of thick, round legs in white drill trousers. His round skull under a white cap looked as if it were immensely thick, too, but there were brains enough in it to discover and take advantage maliciously of poor old Nelson's nervousness before everything that was invested with the merest shred of authority. He muskirk would land on the point and perambulate silently every part of the plantation as if the whole place belonged to him before he went into the house. On the veranda he would take the best chair and would stay for tiffin or dinner, just simply stay on, without taking the trouble to invite himself by so much as a word. He ought to have been kicked if only for his manner to Miss Freya. Had he been a naked savage, armed with spears and poisoned arrows, old Nelson would have gone for him with his bare fists. But these gold shoulder straps, Dutch shoulder straps at that, were enough to terrify the old fellow. So he let the beggar treat him with heavy contempt, devour his daughter with his eyes, and drink the best part of his little stock of wine. I saw something of this, and on occasion I tried to pass a remark on the subject. It was pitiable to see the trouble in old Nelson's round eyes. At first he cried out that the lieutenant was a good friend of his, a very good fellow. I went on staring at him pretty hard, so that at last he faltered, and had to own that, of course, Heemskirk was not a very genial person outwardly, 
but all the same at bottom. I haven't yet met a genial Dutchman out here, I interrupted. Geniality, after all, is not of much consequence, but don't you see? Nelson looked suddenly so frightened at what I was going to say that I hadn't the heart to go on. Of course, I was going to tell him that the fellow was after his girl. That just describes it exactly. What Heemskirk might have expected, or what he thought he could do, I do not know. For all I can tell, he might have imagined himself irresistible, or have taken Freya for what she was not, on account of her lively, assured, unconstrained manner. But there it is. He was after that girl. Nelson could see it well enough, only he preferred to ignore it. He did not want to be told of it. All I want is to live in peace and quietness with the Dutch authorities, he mumbled shamefacedly. He was incurable. I was sorry for him, and I really think Miss Freya was sorry for her father, too. She restrained herself for his sake, and as everything she did, she did it simply, unaffectedly, and even good-humoredly. No small effort, that, because in Heemskirk's attentions there was an insolent touch of scorn, hard to put up with. Dutchmen of that sort are overbearing to their inferiors, and that officer of the king looked upon old Nelson and Freya as quite beneath him in every way. I can't say I felt sorry for Freya. She was not the sort of girl to take anything tragically. One could feel for her and sympathize with her difficulty, but she seemed equal to any situation. It was rather admiration she extorted by her competent serenity. It was only when Jasper and Heemskirk were together at the bungalow, as it happened now and then, that she felt the strain, and even then it was not for everybody to see. My eyes alone could detect a faint shadow on the radiance of her personality. Once I could not help saying to her appreciatively, Upon my word, you are wonderful. She let it pass with a faint smile. The great thing is to prevent Jasper becoming unreasonable, she said, and I could see real concern lurking in the quiet depths of her frank eyes, gazing straight at me. You will help to keep him quiet, won't you? Of course, we must keep him quiet, I declared, understanding very well the nature of her anxiety. He's such a lunatic, too, when he's roused. He is, she assented in a soft tone, for it was our joke to speak of Jasper abusively. But I have tamed him a bit. He's quite a good boy now. He would squash Heemskirk like a black beetle all the same, I remarked. Rather, she murmured, and that wouldn't do, she added quickly. Imagine the state poor Papa would get into. Besides, I mean to be mistress of the dear brig and sail about these seas, not go off wandering ten thousand miles away from here. The sooner you are on board to look after the man and the brig, the better, I said seriously. They need you to steady them both a bit. I don't think Jasper will ever get sobered down till he has carried you off from this island. You don't see him when he is away from you, as I do. He's in a state of perpetual elation, which almost frightens me. At this, she smiled again, and then looked serious, for it could not be unpleasant to her to be told of her power, and she had some sense of her responsibility. She slipped away from me suddenly, because Heemskirk, with old Nelson in attendance at his elbow, was coming up the steps of the veranda. Directly his head came above the level of the floor, his ill-natured black eyes shot glances here and there. 
Where is your girl, Nelson? he asked, in a tone as if every soul in the world belonged to him. And then, to me, the goddess is flown, eh? Nelson's cove, as we used to call it, was crowded with shipping that day. There was my first steamer, then the Neptune gunboat further out, and the Bonito brig, anchored as usual so close in shore that it looked as if, with a little skill and judgment, one could shy a hat from the veranda onto her scrupulously holy-stoned quarter-deck. Her braces flashed like gold. Her white body paint had a sheen like a satin robe. The rack of her varnished spars and the big yards, squared to a hair, gave her a sort of martial elegance. She was a beauty. No wonder that in possession of a craft like that and the promise of a girl like Freya, Jasper lived in a state of perpetual elation, fit, perhaps, for the seventh heaven, but not exactly safe in a world like ours. I remarked politely to Heemskirk that, with three guests in the house, Miss Freya had no doubt domestic matters to attend to. I knew, of course, that she had gone to meet Jasper at a certain cleared spot on the banks of the only stream on Nelson's little island. The commander of the Neptune gave me a dubious black look and began to make himself at home, flinging his thick cylindrical carcass into a rocking chair and unbuttoning his coat. Old Nelson sat down opposite him in a most unassuming manner, staring anxiously with his round eyes and fanning himself with his hat. I tried to make conversation to while the time away. Not an easy task with a morose, enamored Dutchman constantly looking from one door to another and answering one's advances either with a jeer or a grunt. However, the evening passed off all right. Luckily, there is a degree of bliss too intense for elation. Jasper was quiet and concentrated silently in watching Freya. As we went on board our respective ships, I offered to give his brig a tow out next morning. I did it on purpose to get him away at the earliest possible moment, so in the first cold light of the dawn we passed by the gunboat, black and still, without a sound in her at the mouth of the glassy cove. But with tropical swiftness, the sun had climbed twice its diameter above the horizon before we had rounded the reef and got abreast of the point. On the biggest boulder there stood Freya, all in white, and in her helmet, like a feminine martial statue, with a rosy face, as I could see very well with my glasses. She fluttered an expressive handkerchief, and Jasper, running up the main rigging of the white and warlike brig, waved his hat in response. Shortly afterwards, we parted, I to the northward, and Jasper heading east, with a light wind on the quarter, for Banjermason and two other ports. This peaceful occasion was the last on which I saw all these people assembled together. The charmingly fresh and resolute Freya, the innocently round-eyed old Nelson, Jasper, keen, long-limbed, lean-faced, admirably self-contained in his manner, because inconceivably happy under the eyes of his Freya, all three, tall, fair, and blue-eyed in varied shades, and amongst them the swarthy, arrogant, black-haired Dutchman, shorter nearly by a head, and so much thicker than any of them that he seemed to be a creature capable of inflating itself, a grotesque specimen of mankind from some other planet. 
The contrast struck me all at once as we stood in the lighted veranda after rising from the dinner table. I was fascinated by it for the rest of the evening, and I remember the impression of something funny and ill-omened at the same time in it to this day.